So this, this is the J Lever prototype. Highly leveraged 58 mil manual lever action espresso maker that we're looking to do a Kickstarter on. And today we're finally doing a reveal video. We're going to be talking about its features, design logic and principles and the associated tools that will come with it. We're so excited for this espresso maker because this can do what no other espresso maker can do. And I'm not just talking about the crazy versatility. For example, it can do pressure, temperature, mineral and pH profiling all at the same time via separation of water chambers. No, that's not what I'm talking about. This with an add-on attachment for beginners and enthusiasts alike will instantaneously adjust and manipulate puck resistance on the fly as you're pulling your shot. So you get close to ideal espresso timings each time, largely irrespective of grind size without any electronics. That makes dialing in so much easier because it broadens the grind settings on the grinder and eliminates late stage channeling. And it could pull an espresso shot like no other espresso machine in the world can because it fundamentally manipulates the physics of traditional extraction. And it gives us yet another espresso variable to explore and to profile. Yeah, I had to complicate things even more. But that attachment that can do all that, that's for another video. Today we're just talking about this, what I still call a traditional espresso maker, but with a modern twist. And I'm going to reserve the word traditional for all espresso machines that don't do any special puck manipulation. So my name is Greg Rahola. I'm the inventor of this contraption as it's being called. I was a former academic physicist at RMIT University. I got into the green tech sector to make a difference a little faster. I've been running an eco business for about 15 years. So I'm a bit of an environmentalist, but now it's time to branch out and in innovate in a slightly different field, a love of mine coffee. So it all started with this, a simple concept and a, and a thought experiment. Consider this, if you were a coffee grind inside a coffee puck and you couldn't look out into the world and you were being extracted, what bulk physical properties would you feel or could you measure during extraction that a, an espresso, espresso machine could manipulate? The main ones are temperature, pressure, flow rate, and of course you'd feel your own kind of um, stress tensor matrix, you know, whether you're being sheared or compressed one way or the other. The most important component there is the downward compressive force you'd feel from the grinds above you pushing down on you. But that's all you'd know. And the concept was this, if you could reproduce those basic puck conditions, then it wouldn't matter what espresso machine you'd use to do that with. It wouldn't matter if it was a $10,000 espresso machine or a $200 espresso machine, you'd still get fundamentally the same espresso because the puck physics are identical between the two. So I wanted to invent a simple minimalistic espresso maker that could reproduce those puck conditions and hence pull cafe quality espresso at home. And I'm talking Melbourne, Australia espresso, right? It's arguably some of the best espresso in the world. So I came up with this highly leveraged lever action espresso machine. In about a month or two, but the longer I played with it, the more I realized that it's not just about the machine or the nine bars or the, or, or the more modern six bars or the flow rate or the shot weight or the right water temperature. Now, don't get me wrong, all of those things are important, but the other half of the story is, as a lot of YouTubers will tell you, is the use of filtered water, puck distribution, level tamping, and fresh beans. And it's only if you get all of those things correct that you get outstanding espresso. So I couldn't just stop at the espresso maker. I wanted to solve dial-in and I wasn't happy with the tools available for that second half of the story. Although I have to say, I didn't try them all, but I wanted to develop my own solution. And finally, I'm happy with all of those solutions. So today we're talking about the machine, the tamper, the WD tool, the funnel, the volumetric scoop, and the story solution. So let's start first with the key overall design principles that I've adopted, not just with this espresso maker, but the tools and J Lever Espresso as a startup. So number one, I love the concept of toolless sequential assembly where one part locks into the other and you keep building parts up until 
the last part locks everything into place. I've implemented this throughout uh, all of the tools, not just the Espresso Maker. I love that concept. Number two, ergonomics and a joy to use. And that comes with testing and refining and then testing some more, getting rid of all these little annoyances and optimizing things to the nth degree. So number three, design guardrails for excellent espresso. Identify the kind of fallback position that people will invariably adopt when they use these tools and make sure that fallback method works with the tool in question. So I'll give you an example. When you pour boiling water in here, it gives you 92 degrees without thinking. Another example, the length of these arms and leverage is specially selected so that when the average person leans on it, they get six to nine bars. Number four, it has to be fast. Fast to use, fast to clean, service and maintain. People just don't have time to muck around with uh, coffee sometimes. They're running out the door or for whatever reason. Number five, now having said that, some people want to experiment. So it has to give full artistic freedom for the home barista. It has to be versatile. Number six, I drew heavily on this very Japanese concept of simplicity and minimalism, where the tool becomes an extension of your body and where there's a bit of technique involved and so that you're not cramming all this complexity and um, mechanisms inside the tool and you're pressing a button and then you have all these things that can break and it's over engineered. I didn't want that. Number seven, no planned obsolescence. As an environmentalist, I have a big issue with some bulk manufacturers. They kind of know the stress strain curve of a material and they make sure it just reaches that kind of pressure fatigue working phase so that after some cycles it breaks and then you have to throw the thing out and buy a new machine. No planned obsolescence. Let's get back to manufacturing stuff that lasts a lifetime. And that leads us on to number eight, carbon cost to manufacture. It has to have a minimum of materials, maximum longevity, maximum extraction, decreased coffee waste. Now, having said that, there may be a pod version down the track, but we'll try and be as environmentally responsible as possible. Number nine, I wanted to keep the manufacturing costs down because I wanted to build a machine that was accessible to everybody, not just people that have 10Ks to drop on an espresso machine. And number 10, modular design and backwards compatibility. Whatever upgrade we'll come up with down the track, we'll try and make it compatible with earlier versions. Now let's have a look at the features of the Espresso Maker. But before we do, I have to preface this. This is all still in flux. I don't know what the end functions are gonna be. We still haven't even done a freedom to operate search. So there might be some intellectual property that blocks us from certain functions and people need to give us feedback, but this is what we've got so far. Firstly, reproduce obviously the genuine espresso pipe conditions. Six to nine bars, one to three espresso ratio shots and 95 degree water temperatures. Number two, compatible with standard uh, porter filter baskets. 58 mil, 49 mil, and we'll probably do a 40 mil at some stage. Number three, adjustable leverage ratio and multi-dose capable. So people come in different sizes and they drink anywhere from seven gram doses to 25 gram doses. And by some happy coincidence, the people that drink 25 gram doses have the strength to pull a larger espresso as compared to those that drink seven gram doses. Also, I wanted this espresso maker to be for everybody, you know, big and small, young and old, retired or time poor professionals, people just starting out in espresso or enthusiasts that want complete control over the extractions and, and they want to explore various profiles. Number four, nearly all stainless and silicon construction. The base will be aluminium, might have a couple of plastic parts here and there, but the majority of it will be stainless. Now number five, open source o-ring and gasket design molds that will release to the public in 3D CAD model parametric design form, um, where people with 3D printer will be able to take the file and muck around with um, certain settings to increase and decrease the uh, gasket size print out a mold and create a, a gasket using pourable silicon that they may sell on Etsy because there might be some portafilter basket that people might want to use, but they may need a specially adapted uh, gasket for it. Number six, no preheating. Preheating will only be required for the lightest of roasts. Number seven, there will be a 12 bar safety pressure release and a safety cover kind of splash shield on top maybe. So let's just quickly talk about the parts that will be included with the Kickstarter because I really think all of these parts are needed to pull a great espresso. And if I left it to the customer, then, you know, they'll be looking for tools and parts. So it will come with the unit, the tamper, the funnel, the WD tool, two of them. One's a deep rake and the other one's 
a surface rake that doubles up as a, an extractor because sometimes the puck's left behind. Volumetric scoop, you'll get a couple of these retainer plates and a spare gasket set. And you will also get a pressure muscle memory training kit where you'll just be able to kind of pull on the unit with the pressure gauge installed and you'll be able to train your muscle just to figure out where that six to nine bar range is. You won't get a pressure gauge where you'll be able to see the pressure during the shot but it depends on the feedback that I'll get. There is room in the cylinder to do something, but at the moment you, you probably won't get it. Now the storage solution that will be sold separately on Kickstarter, but it won't come standard with the kit. Before we pull a shot, let's talk about some of the design logic of the Espresso Maker because it is a bit weird and you may be questioning my sanity, but there is method to the madness, I can assure you. So first and foremost, why an upshot espresso maker? Why didn't I just produce a downshot one? I toyed with the idea, but ultimately there were so many advantages of an upshot espresso maker that I just abandoned the idea of a downshot one. So let's go through them. First and foremost, you get to observe your shot. It's front and center. You can identify pin channeling, excessive ringing, uneven tamping, poor di distribution in general. They can all be identified and diagnosed by viewing your shot. Number two, Water stratification works for you, not against you. So in any cylinder, as the water cools, it will stratify. So the coolest parts of the water will actually fall and the core will actually move up and you'll be using the hottest part to pull your espresso. There will be some sacrificial cold water down the bottom. For an up to down espresso maker, you're always pulling your espresso with that coolest water. And that of course means no preheating. Number three, even pre-infusion because gravity works for you, not against you. So manufacturers go to these great lengths to put in these distributors and these shower screens to make sure that water kind of gently rains down evenly on the puck. But here, gravity works for us. There is a flooding plane that will come up and wet it evenly. Number four, air clears from the system, so it's safer. Compressed air is explosive, compressed water is not. Number five, no air also means there's no gumminess to the connection that you feel. So when you're pushing down on this, you get this kind of intimate feel and connection to what's happening with the puck. And that's really important for being able to manipulate the puck and the extraction. Number six, again, there's less air locking because bubbles float. So it's much easier to kind of clear an airlock puck, which you sometimes get with a really fine grind. So number seven, as if all of that wasn't enough, low center of mass, all the mechanisms to push the piston up are contained in the bottom section. And the contact point with the ground between the arm and the base is one centimeter off the ground. So this feels kind of unnaturally stable when you're pulling your shot, which means you're not paying attention to keeping the kind of maker um, upright. You can pay full attention to what's happening at the puck. Now, number eight, separation of water chambers. So you can have a separator here and you can put one type of water down the bottom and a second type of water um, at the top, and you can do gradients, pH gradients, mineral gradients, temperature gradients, although temperature gradients, I think only to an extent, and you can do all kinds of pro profiles on this. Now, number nine, you can do chilled espresso on steroids, but without the inconvenience of needing to chill anything. So the whole point of chilled espresso is to reduce the loss of these volatiles. But if you look at the evaporation equation, Yes, the saturation vapor pressure scales exponentially fast with temperature, but there's a multiplicative A in front of those equations, and that A is for area. Evaporation of these volatiles scales proportionally with area exposed. So by spreading the moving liquid over a ball, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot because we're increasing the area and hence the evaporation. And we're hoping that the effects from the reduced saturated vapor pressures cancel out the area, increased area, and then some but why not just make the area zero? So this is a 3D printed um, mock-up, but it will be made out of metal. And you'll just put it inside here and it'll float up with the espresso as it's produced and there's zero area. So zero volatiles are getting evaporated and as an added benefit, no oxygen is getting in. And the only time you're actually exposing the espresso to oxygen is when it's kind of cooled and the volatiles are integrated into the, into the espresso so they're less dense and you're pouring off. So yeah, chilled espresso, easy on a, on a bottom to up flow espresso maker. Now lastly, that add-on attachment that I talked about that can automatically adjust the puck resistance on the fly, uh, that works better with a bottom to up flow espresso maker. So that's a big advantage. Now some of the disadvantages, obviously you can't wear your shot 
during your shot. You can only weigh it as you're pouring off and only estimate it next time around using a level. Number two, there's a bit more cleaning involved because obviously you have to clean out the, the bottom unused water. There may be a possibility with a non-return valve inside the actual basket and we we're kind of working on that. So number three, there is a need for pouring off the espresso. We did toy with a spout um, and a drain line, but yeah, didn't, didn't like that. This is just so much easier. Now let's talk about the length of these arms because they are ex excessive and it just won't fit under the typical American style kind of cabinet that overhangs uh, on a kitchen. So why on earth, Greg, did you implement almost one meter span arms? This is nine, 900 mil. And the reason for the length of these arms is that I truly believe that the Gaja Gilda and the Femina baby fell out of favor with the public because they just required too much muscle strength to use. And so I didn't want that for this espresso maker. I wanted something that is really easy to use. Now the other design choices, there's no plastic in contact with hot water. Don't get me wrong, plastic is great. It's a versatile material, uh, it's easily formed, but hot water, Plastic and excessive pressures, they really don't mix. No matter what kind of engineering plastic you're talking about, you have to be really careful not to encroach on that kind of fatigue permanent deformation phase of, of the stress and strain curve. And yeah, I just wanted something that just lasts. And of course, plastic is a permeable material and chemicals will kind of leach out of the plastics. There are some food safe plastics, but no plastic. Now, lastly, this main chamber is going to be thin and it's gonna be thin for a reason. It's still gonna be within the elastic limit, but I wanted a vernier temperature scale effect that works something like this. We know the volume of the water coming into here and we know the metal thickness and the volume of the metal that we're using in the cylinder. We know the heat capacitance of both substances so we can easily calculate the end temperature that you got to get if you pour boiling water directly into this and we can solve those equations backwards to get a metal thickness so that the following criteria is satisfied. Cylinder temperature divided by 10 plus 90 is equal to the end equilibrium temperature of the water. So for example if this was 20 and that's easy to check just with your finger by touching it. The end water temperature is gonna be 90 plus two. If this was 40, the end water temperature is gonna be 94 and so on and so forth. And the metal thickness gauge to get that kind of vernier temperature scale effect is 0.8 mil, which is perfect for deep draw manufacture. Okay, that's enough jibber jabber. Let's reconfigure the camera and let's pull a shot and we'll see the workflow and how fast this thing is. Cold start to clean up. We're using our pre-dosed day one container, 10 second grind on the Bratza, not the fastest, not the slowest, and about a 25 to 30 second shot. So we're timing our shot. The goal is to produce a machine that can produce an espresso in under two minutes from cold start to clean up. We are on 240 volt power here in Australia with the electric kettle. So it might take a little longer to boil the water in other regions with only 120 volt power. I know some older school guys don't like the WD tools, but it does make a difference. About five seconds is all you need with this tool. It's almost essential for lighter roasts on the 58 mil porter filter. On the smaller basket diameters, you can almost skip it. Notice the funnel is in place while tamping. That makes for a much cleaner workflow as the grinds are brushed off. You do have a limited time to get the porter filter on and start your shot, because the water's cooling constantly. One quarter twist on the porter filter as mentioned, so it will be a little faster here. Now I am pulling the shot across the length of the table, and that does require you to have some clear space on the kitchen bench, but you can also pull it perpendicular to the table. Now there are three main movements when pulling a shot with this machine. The first is that push apart tight movement. The next is where you hold your arms as pillars on the levers with your wrist straight. And then finally you straighten your elbows and you just lean into it. Pulling the arms back creates a suction within the cavity. Just sucks all the water back, creates a nice clean dry puck. Simulated sink cleanup. A single rinse in that chamber is all you need. I probably cheated a tab on the rinse time. Maybe it takes a few more seconds. That's about it, that's about two minutes.
So does it pull a great shot of a traditional espresso? Of course it does. It doesn't do anything different than a much more expensive machine. And if you've dialed it in and you observed all the basics that I mentioned, you'll pull a great espresso each time. Maybe it's a little less consistent than decent, but who wants an identical espresso each time? One of the great pleasures of espresso is just identifying the different nuances and flavor that come with the exploration of different espresso parameters. Now, let's just quickly talk about the changes that I'd like to make to this existing prototype. So firstly, higher leverage. This pulls about 80 grams of water. I think that's too much. After about six months of using this, it does kind of wear on you after a while. I think I want to drop it down to about 60 grams max. That's about 25% reduction in water. But because your arms weigh something, that equates to about an almost halving of the muscle strength required to pull the shot. Number two, and even further, increase in leverage down to about a 30 to 40 gram shot over the length of the travel for people that drink smaller doses right down to the point where I think you barely are going to need any mus muscle strength whatsoever and the weight of your arms will be sufficient to bring it up to six bars hopefully now number three a quarter twist to open this instead of instead of a screw uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to both but I think a quarter twist is is better now, number four, this prototype is too heavy. I did build it on the lathe and I've had limited skills on that. But since the chamber is going to be quite thin and this is going to be made out of aluminium and this top is going to be quite thin as well. And in fact, the silicon is going to have grooves on the inside. It's going to be significantly lighter. Number five, also, as I mentioned, a pressure safety release, self-resetting. Number six, a self-energizing seal. It's going to be really easy to, to lock into place. We may need a silicon bellows to actually get the cake out. So we'll see how that goes. We'll play around with it. Number seven, tougher bearing shafts here. So after about a thousand shots, this is the type of wear that was visible on this. And by the way, this was the only wear that was visible. I think if I made these titanium, there wouldn't be that kind of wear. Now, number eight, probably add-on handles that you'll be able to purchase separately for the portafilter and the main unit just for pouring off, similar to the nine Barista. And number nine, a hygiene shield when you're pulling a a shot for a guest because you're kind of leaning over it. But that's it. That's all I change. Let's just briefly talk about why I love this thing over anything I've used so far. And yes, I'm the inventor, so I'm a little biased. Take these comments for what they are. I'll try and put my reasoning into words so you can be the judge. But after pulling so many shots on this for over that six month period, firstly, it's, it's stupid fast. S sometimes you're running out the door and you just want a shot of espresso and you don't want to wait around for the machine to heat up that's that's a huge plus secondly and this is mainly the lever aspect of it although this takes it to a whole new level but you have this intimate connection to what is happening in the puck there is no trapped air and these blades are hard and steel so the connection is not gummy or soft and that's really important because those first few seconds when you're passing water through the puck you really need that kind of feedback engaging how resistant that puck is to water and you only have a split second or two to make a decision on what you're going to be doing if it's not very resistant at all and you see coffee come out too quickly you can slam on the pressure and that kind of slams the puck and locks those ultra fines into place so that you can preserve the resistance of the puck and that recovers your espresso timings. If you feel a really resistant puck then you can do a longer pre-infusion at lower pressure to evacuate the fines so that you can decrease the resistance of the puck and then you ramp up pressure slowly and so you have this ton of control over the espresso timings so that's the second reason on most espresso machines you press a button and you get what you get and you go through this dialing process where you're hunting around for this narrow range on the grinder and that can lead to a lot of wasted coffee but this control and confidence in being able to manipulate your shot also means that you're not faffing around pulling out a scale and weighing your dose you just scoop it and it saves time and there are other things like it's really fast to clean up there's little to no maintenance it's really portable you can tuck it away in a corner and of course it generally makes great espresso so that's why i love this thing so let's talk about the design logic of some of these tools because they're almost as important as the actual espresso maker itself. Starting with the WD tool, I chose this kind of multi-level design because if the density of needles is too great in this kind of cylinder part, then you can get this kind of pinhole channeling in your puck. This will not create pinhole channeling. Secondly, there are these kind of surface rakes. So it's really fast. You're doing deep WD and surface raking at the same time. Thirdly, the most ergonomic way to hold this 
at a 90 degree angle to the puck is actually a, a square shape. So that's why it's square. It also has adjustable surface rake needles. So some pucks have different thicknesses and you need to make adjustments to these. It will have blunt 0.3 millimeter needles and there will be a magnet, a stick on magnet where you can attach this out of the way. Child can't get to it and it'll be red for safety. Now moving on to the funnel, a steep slope so that the grinds fall off, magnetic precision um, radius so that the actual tamper will brush off the, the grinds and obviously not too tall so that it fits in most grinders and you can actually put your, um, your fingers in there to tamp it. Now moving on to the tamper, lots of finger holds, exchangeable disc held in place magnetically because obviously we need to do different sizes and adjustable curvature on the tamper because sometimes you do need a curved tamper. Also you'll get this rounded um, exchangeable nib that's just a bit too large to fit into that hole so it actually forms a what I call a pivot tamper and the whole point here is a training aid to um, identify how well you're distributing your puck because the force can only be placed in the center so it will actually curve towards the side with the larger heaping and then once you've got your WD technique down pat you will change this out for the um, for the other nib. Lastly you've got a spirit level on the tamper just a really simple way of doing level tamping without all the complexity of having the mechanisms of um, the leveling because that, that can get really expensive so yeah that's the tamper. Now for the scoop it is adjustable from seven grams all the way to 25 grams, you pull this out and you flip it around to get the lower doses. It uses the same principles as one of those chemists volumetric measuring flasks where you have a narrowing at the top so that the water levels change very quickly with very little water. So you have this narrowing here and you kind of put your coffee beans in, you, you brush it out. It's accurate to about plus or minus 2%. Um, I think the low, lower doses are less accurate. It's fast and what you'll do is you'll take a bag of coffee, dial it in for the weight, and then you'll be just scooping in it and putting it into your day one storage containers. Now the beauty of this system is that when combined with that non-dialing attachment, you can store a bunch of different coffees in your day one storage container and you can have a different coffee every day without needing to dial them in. Now lastly, the storage container. These are just 3D printed mock-ups and of course I've chipped it right before the video. They lock into place. You're gonna get about 10 per stack and then maybe five stacks in all. Hematic seal on this. So there's, there's a rubberized seal here. We'll have kind of self-locating system so you're not kind of fumbling around for the thread. It has to be a hematic seal because the temperature changes during the day and any container as the temperature changes, the air pressure changes and it just sucks air in and out, just breathes, evacuates the volatiles and brings in oxygen. And after a while, the beans just aren't the same. The logic here is that the very last dose that you've got from your coffee beans will only be opened once. So it will preserve that kind of day one status right down to the very last dose. So in our next video, we'll show you this non-dial-in uh, version attachment. And then if we get enough positive feedback from you, the public and the Espresso community, we'll get a team together and we'll do a kickstart. But the whole purpose of this video is to get some feedback from you. So what do you think? Do you love it? Do you hate it? Uh, would you prefer a, a ratchet system with shorter arms where you have one movement for the pre-infusion phase and then the main movement for the extraction phase? Or would you prefer a version where you have a bayonet attachment on this main water chamber and you can actually separate it from the main base to pour your espresso and then take it over to the sink for cleaning but then you kind of need uh, to get the piston out because it will be detachable at that point and then you're kind of handling hot parts I'm not sure I kind of like that or do you just want us to skip the manual version altogether we are planning a motorized version with a central lead screw and a brass nut and a stepper motor where the stepper motor will actually push the piston up and all you'll be doing is pressing a button it will have an electric kettle style detachable base and it will have the puck adjustment and manipulation means built in. But I, I really love this kind of manual version just because of the amount of control that you have. So if you love this Espresso Maker and maybe you want to see it on Kickstarter, can I ask you to post the link to this video on your social media circle just to help spread the word and just ask your friends, what do you think? If you've got a friend that um, loves Espresso, but only if you believe in the project. Over the next few weeks, I'll be reaching out to online stores, various people in the industry asking for their opinion. I'll be looking for potential distributors in various countries. And lastly, don't forget to subscribe and join our mailing list. That's the best way to kind of show support. The website is now live. I promise I won't bombard you with tons of videos and you can always unsubscribe at a later date. So that's it for now. Thanks for watching and we'll see you in the next video.